without further ado, let me introduce our speaker who has been making the trek from Wausau to La Crosse and now has came home to the motherland. Seattle native that now lives in Houston, Texas. Give him a warm Chippewa Valley welcome, Gary Thomas. Thank you, Keith. Hey, it's great to be here. Since you mentioned I'm a Seattle native, still a Seahawks fan, I feel like it'd be impolite in a room filled with Wisconsin men not to thank you heartily for Russell Wilson. <laughs> you guys have had more than your share of Hall of Fame quarterbacks over the years. I'm just so grateful you let one slip, slip up Northwest so that we could uh, enjoy the love for a little bit. He is a wizard, and if they ever give him an offensive line, he'll do even more. So, let's pray. Lord, I thank you for the men here, the businesses they represent, the families that they pour into, God, just the, the influence that you've given them, and then their willingness to spend here at a, a lunchtime hearing from you. And so I just pray that you would make that happen, that you would bless them, that you would encourage them, that you would inspire us. Lord, that some might even yet live longer because they were here today. We'll pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Keith asked me to speak on Everybody Matters, which I, I love to talk about, and I'll get into what that is, but I always feel a little bit of trepidation because I feel like all my books, it's, it's preaching a little bit, and it challenges us in an area that can be somewhat difficult. And I also know that there's a natural pushback. Nobody likes to be challenged, and many of us particularly, we don't like it if it seems like somebody's bragging. Maybe some years ago, this bumper sticker appeared. Go to the next one. Uh, all over. My child is an honor student at Rolling River Elementary. It started appearing everywhere. And so it was probably inevitable that somebody would push back with this bumper sticker. My kid beat up your honor roll student. They just weren't going to let that sit, right? And so then maybe 15 years ago, these little circles started appearing on cars. Uh, runners would usually know those. 26.2, somebody said, hey, I've run a marathon. And then the half marathoners had to get in there 13.1. They weren't going to be lost. And so the next one was uh, 140.6 and 70.3. Anybody know what that is besides Keith? The the triathlons, the Ironman, the 140 is a full Ironman, and then the 70.3 is half, although when you travel 70 miles a day, self-propelled, calling that half of anything seems to me unkind. I was in a running goods store where I saw these four stickers, and I asked the owner, keep in mind, this is a running goods store, right, where they sell running shoes and running gear and all that, and I said, what's the best-selling sticker that you have? What would you guess would be the best-selling sticker they have? Well, that, this is actually the one that they said sell best, 0, 0.0. Everybody's saying on their bumpers how much they'd run. Somebody says, okay, you tell me how much you run, I'm going to tell you how much I don't run. Which, which is always what makes me nervous when I'm going to talk about today, which is really this. How we care for our bodies, the way we feed them, whether we exercise them, what we do with them is an expression of our faith and love for the God who created us. The God who created us, we show respect for Him by taking care of what He has created and given us. If we go to 2 Corinthians 7, 1, Paul says this, With promises like this to pull us on, dear friends, let's make a clean break with everything that defiles or distracts us both within and without. Let's make our entire lives fit and holy temples for the worship of God. Now I think a lot of times as Christians, I know we all, might not all be here as Christians, but Christians will understand this, that a lot of times we, we push, we, we de-emphasize the importance of caring for the body because what really matters is our souls, what really matters is our minds, and we see the world overemphasizing it. The world obsesses over the body, the world glorifies the body, so we don't want to be a part of that. But we don't have to go where the world goes to understand that it's still as important as a part of our Christian life um, to take care of the body God has given us. Because there's a big difference between the approach I think God calls us to and the approach Hollywood leads us to. God's approach is about living the abundant life. 
His approach really is, I want you to live the fullest, most vibrant, most impactful, fulfilling life. So at the end of your life, you look back and say, what a ride. I used every day. Those were good years. It was a great life. So God encourages, I believe, to consider our health so that we could live an abundant life. In Hollywood, it's about creating an artificial shape. They're obsessed with the body not to have an abundant life, but really for entirely different motivations. Um, being a pastor in Houston, I had a young woman visit me. She had been a cheerleader for the Houston Texans. And her life took a turn. She wasn't accepted for the second year. I asked, well, how come they didn't want to get you the second year? She says, well, they said I've gotten too thick. Now, if you could see a picture of her, I think your jaw would drop open. She looked to me like a very attractive, athletic young woman. And if she was considered too thick to be a Houston Texans cheerleader, apparently you have to be able to slide under a door wearing a winter coat to qualify as a Houston Texan cheerleader. As the husband of a wife and the father of two daughters near her age, it made me angry at what people think the ideal body should be. And so we're not talking about that. And women have sort of lived with this for a long time, the whole Barbie doll phenomenon. But what they found now is that men are facing the same thing. And, and we know this, and some of you have seen this in the room. If you go back to male action stars, even 30 years ago, and you compare how the male leads in action movies look today, we've gotten the same Barbie phenomenon now just applied to men. And a tree of researchers from an Ivy League school talked about what they called the Adonis Complex. And what they mean by that is just as there was this absurdly skinny view of women, now there's this uh, just incredible, everybody's supposed to look like a bodybuilder view of what men are supposed to look like. So that even the famous have to struggle. It becomes a full-time job to try to get this artificial body shape that people say is acceptable. George Clooney was voted by People Magazine twice, one of the most beautiful people in the world. And even he has a lot of his insecurities. He was talking about when he was a young actor, he found himself walking the Hollywood Walk of Fame, you know, where they put the Hollywood stars there and they put their hands down and their feet down. And he came across Clark Gable's square. And he thought it was kind of funny because apparently Clark Gable had rather small hands and feet and he just thought, wow, he's this great actor, but man, he had small feet. Well, George Clooney's career took off. Ultimately, he was asked to put his star on the sidewalk. And he remembered that episode with Clark Gable. And so the day that he was inducted into the Hollywood Walk of Fame, though he has a very respectable size 11 pair of shoes, he didn't want somebody 20 years from now laughing at the size of his feet. So he went out to the store and just for that day bought a size 14 pair of shoes to sink in with some men. So, I mean, even those that people make it who says they have made it don't feel like they made it. So I'm not suggesting we try to do that. But what I am suggesting is that we consider taking care of our bodies not from a worldly motivation, but from a spiritual one. And here's the different motivation. As Christians, we treat our body as instruments instead of ornaments. To the world, it's about creating ornaments that people look at. To God, it's about creating instruments. Paul says this, offer the parts of your body to him as instruments of righteousness. In Romans 12, 1, offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, which is your spiritual worship. And it's an amazing thing to me when I realize this this fallen body that's getting older, that's lost its hair, that doesn't have the muscle it should have and other parts that it shouldn't have, God can use it as a work for His eternal purposes. The world doesn't value the body for that. The world says, you know, does He have a full head of hair? How does He look with His shirt off? God doesn't look at that. God says, if you offer your body to me as an instrument of righteousness, right then it becomes holy. Better than beautiful, it is holy, it is sacred, it is a tool of God, and then it is pleasing to God. It might not please younger people, nobody would say, well, boy, that's, that's the beach body you want to look at, but in God's eyes, it pleases Him. When anybody, in any shape, at any age, is offered to Him for service. Which means our holiness acceptance before God doesn't rest on the shape of our bodies. 
It rests on Jesus' bruised and broken body. That's the assurance we have as Christians. That's the only body through which we find our acceptance before God. So it's not about making God love us more. Losing 20 pounds or gaining 20 pounds won't make us God love us any more or less. What makes, pleasing, what makes our bodies pleasing to God is when they are offered continuously to God as a sacrifice of service. Because God is our creator. He's not just our God, he's our creator. He knows the bodies he gave us, and he knows not every body is alike. Not every body shape, it, it fits with who we are. I was at a family camp one time, and I was thrilled for this, because we were with a group of men, and these men were a bit older than me. And they're those absurdly skinny men. I thought they did triathlons and never ate or anything, but they just had great genes, right? And so every meal, they out ate me two to one. They would go back and get seconds. I would eat my meal. They would get double desserts. I wouldn't have any. In the afternoon, I went out for a run. They sat on a bench and ate ice cream, laughing at people who run on vacation. And, and they're so scared. And it was just opened up Lisa's eyes. And it's not a matter of how much you eat or how much you exercise. I was eating so much less and exercising so much more. We just have different bodies. And here's the thing. God knows that. God knows the struggles each one of us have for our areas of health. Where we're weakest, where we're strongest. He sees what we're doing and it's pleasing to Him when we offer that to Him. Here's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, 19. This is what challenged, it, challenged me so much. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price, therefore honor God with your body. Now this may be the most culturally incorrect statement you could make today. People are passionate about owning their bodies. Keep your laws off my bodies is a popular slogan. The thinking is if two people give their consent, who should care what they do? And Paul is saying, well, actually, if you call God your creator, even more, if you call God your Lord and master and savior and king, he does care what you do with your body because it doesn't belong to you. That radically transformed the way I looked at my body. In, in, in this sense, I, before my own books could feed my family, I worked on books for celebrities, helping them write theirs. One of those books was with John Ashcroft, an incredible guy. He was a two-term governor in the state of Missouri, went on to be senator of the state of Missouri, was briefly a presidential candidate in the year that George W. Bush uh, eventually won. Uh, just one of the finest men I've ever met with incredible integrity, loves the Lord. I mean, he just, I wish he could be president someday. I, I'm sure he'll never run now, but he was just phenomenal. And we were working on this book together, and he, I loved working with him because he had so much to say. He had so much to offer, and he was such a man of integrity. He gave me this personal file, and it had some anecdoted letters from his father. It had some things where he had personally written on notes. And he handed it to me. He said, yeah, we've got a chapter coming up. Look at this before we work on this chapter. I think you'll get a lot of material here. Well, I was terrified to take this file because I'm terrible at keeping track of paper. I've lost more files than, than a staple store has, right? I'm, I'm always having to reprint things. I just can't find them. I'm just not very good with organizing things. I said, John, please, no, I, I don't want to lose this. Why don't we make a copy and I'll just bring the copies? I says, no, this is a personal book where my Senate office, he wouldn't make 25 paper copies in his Senate office for a personal problem. I mean, that's how much he viewed integrity. He didn't want there to be even a hint of corruption. So he said, you're, you're a responsible young man. I was a little younger then. I, I'm sure you can handle it. So I took that file, and I got to tell you, I knew where that file was every second of the day. I couldn't sleep if I couldn't tell you exactly where that file was. I made sure I didn't lose it, and I got it back to him a week later. Why did I take such great care of it? Because it wasn't mine. I was there by that. What if he does get elected president and they're writing his biography? He says, what happened in this section of his life? We don't know. Some idiot biographer lost. Some idiot writer lost it. You know? and, and, and so treating that file differently because it wasn't mine, when I realized that God says my body isn't mine, how I feed it or what I do with it, it's not just up to me. God has a claim on my body. 
and what I do with it. And I love it because usually on January 1, we want to get fitter, but we do it from a me perspective. We want to feel better and we want to look better. And I get it. I understand those motivations. But if you think about it, those can be just as sinful as not being in shape. It can be, it can be selfishness and vanity, right? We, we want to look better, which is vanity. We just want to feel better. That's selfishness. So all we can often do in January 1 is try to trade gluttony and sloth for selfishness and vanity. We might look better in the world's eyes, but do we look any better for God's? In God's? Are, are we doing it for the right reason? In God's economy, that's what matters everything. It's not to look better to the world. It's to offer our souls to God. But here's the thing. If we take it seriously, there's going to be a huge spiritual challenge. A spiritual challenge. Let me explain what I mean by that. When it comes to body care, exercise aerobically has always come easy to me. I, I hate lifting weights, which you can probably tell, or you could if I wasn't wearing a shirt. Uh, I know as I get older, strength training is really good. It's just I don't enjoy it, and it's hard for me to force myself to do it. But I've always loved the aerobic activity. I've always loved the running. I've loved sports. I'm just not particularly athletically gifted. So when I would make a mistake and the coach would say, run laps, for me, that was the best part of the practice. I said, maybe I just better do it. You don't have to be enormously coordinated, you just have to be willing to make yourself hurt, right? And you can run, and, and that's what I could do. And what happened is, when I was running, particularly marathons, it covered a lot of food errors. I could eat a lot of what I wanted because I was running so many miles. But then, when I turned 50, another thing happened. I turned 50, which your metabolism slows down, and then I moved from Seattle to Houston. Seattle is a land of organic vegetables, sushi, and seafood, which None of those are that tempting to me. And then I moved to Houston, which has the best barbecue, steaks, and Tex-Mex in the world, all of which are very attractive to me. And then it's just much harder to run in Houston than in Seattle. In Seattle, we have a problem with rain, but I have three different raincoats. If you're not dressed in the rain, it's not a big deal. I don't know how to dress for heat and humidity, which we get seven months out of the year. I mean, there's no real way to dress against humidity. So I wasn't running as much, and then I was eating more, and now I was working in a church office instead of for myself, and people just love to dump food on church staff. I don't know what that is, but we have this kitchen, and like people will go to Hawaii, and they bring back those boxes of like chocolate-covered macadamia nuts. If you have, I mean, those are just killer. They're incredible, and sometimes with caramel in there. The problem with that is macadamia nuts have more fat and calories than any other nut, which is why we cover them in chocolate, right? That's, just, that's the American way, all right? Take the worst, make it a little bit worse. And so for a while, I could handle it. I get older, I, I moved to Houston, and it was a little more of a challenge. But here's what I love about still being engaged. It humiliates me trying to do this. You know, a lot of this, we might get a little spiritually arrogant because we're saying, well, I'm not sinning sexually. I'm not getting drunk. I don't put the family's mortgage on red at the roulette wheel. But we have this other area where we might be compromising a bit in God's eyes. And when we take it seriously, what I found, it gives me compassion that all of us are sinners at the foot of the cross. All of us have our own struggles. And the humility that comes from not being able to be all that we want to be is actually a good thing. Our culture doesn't value humility. In many sectors, in fact, humility is looked down as a weakness in business. But scripture exalts humility. Humility not that you deny your strengths. Humility isn't thinking less of yourself. It's thinking less about yourself. But it does cause, call us to a place of dependence upon God and focus on others. And that's what I found this struggle does. There's three times in Scripture. And it's very unusual that the same verse is repeated verbatim three times. But it is in Proverbs and James and Peter that God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. So I realize that even though I don't feel like I have a control on this and that I still slip up, I mean, it, it's a rare day when I feel like I get everything right. That because I'm engaged in it, the, the humility I feel from it, spiritually, that's a good thing. This physical challenge, even lived out imperfectly, 
does great spiritual benefit instead of just giving up but continuing in. And here's the spiritual challenge behind it. This is where I found it so much of a struggle. If you decide, okay, I, I, I think I do want to do a little bit better. So you decide this week you're going to maybe forego the seconds, maybe forego a couple desserts, kind of watch what you eat. And you have a spouse or a roommate or a child or something that, that, that's laughing at your efforts. And then you decide you're going to get out there and exercise two or three times or maybe even walk five times that week while the other person is laughing at you while they sit on the couch eating nachos, watching the game, whatever they're doing. You do that for an entire week, seven days. At the end of that week, let's say maybe you've either maintained your weight or you lost half a pound or a quarter pound. Do your pants feel fit better? Probably not. Do you have more energy level? I don't know that a half a pound is going to make any difference. And the person laughing at you, do, do, they've been eating more and they haven't been exercising. Let's say they gain a quarter of a pound. Are their pants tighter? No, probably not. A quarter pound, you can handle that. Do they have less energy? No, it's not going to make much difference. But if you push that out from one week to 10 weeks, to 20 weeks, to 52 weeks, to a year, Suddenly it's not half a pound, it can be five pounds, it can be ten pounds, and then you start to notice a huge difference. And here's the thing about body care. Body care requires immediate sacrifice for delayed rewards. Indulgence has immediate benefits and delayed consequences. In so many ways I feel like this is a brilliant struggle that God has given us because if we can handle it with food and exercise, those of you that are in the financial industry, this is how you become wealthy, right? You, you have immediate consequences from doing the responsible thing with many delayed benefits. Or if you just give in and spend whatever you want, yeah, you have it now, you've got it on credit, but there's delayed consequences, interest in having to pay it off. It, it's the same thing to be said of our marriages, of parenting. There's so many issues where this is the lesson we have to learn. This is where the abundant life is found. When we can learn, we do what is right, even when there isn't the immediate payoff, because we trust God. He says, I'm trying to lead you into the abundant life, and so if you will lean in to what I'm calling you to do, in the end, it will be so worth it. So it's about pursuing the abundant life. If we don't pursue the abundant life, and here's where I slip, and I see a lot of people slip, instead of pursuing the abundant life, we settle for the just get through it life. And that's where I think most of our culture lives, the just get through it life. Uh, when I was running and training for marathons, I was having this foot issue and I went to my doctor and he just said, Gary, you're really at the age where you might want to give up running. So I switched doctors. <laughs> Isn't that what we do as guys? We don't like what the doctor says, we find another doctor. And he was a marathoner, he said, no, we can get through this. And he told me about one patient he had that he had been working with for some time, but he really became alarmed because this man's statistics and blood work kept going downhill. He said, I've got to deal with the cause. The man was way overweight, not a little bit. He smoked. He drank too much. He didn't exercise at all, but he was powerful in the business community and influential in his own right. And so the doctor said, look, I I'm really concerned. Can, can you give up? the cigarettes. He goes, this is, a moral, this is a health issue, not a moral issue. I'm just concerned about what it's doing for you. He goes, doctor, I have an intense day. Those cigarettes keep me focused. They keep me going. I just don't think I could be productive. I just think at this season in my company's uh, history, I, I need to be firing on all cylinders. And without the cigarettes, I just don't think I could get there. He said, all right, well, how about you give me the ice cream at night? He says, Doctor, that's my one reward. I work so hard all day long. I'll sit and I'll watch 11 o'clock news. I've got my bowl of ice cream. It's my one indulgence. Are you going to take away my one indulgence? He said, well, you can give me a 20 to 30 minute walk at lunch. He goes, Doctor, I don't let anybody go out at lunch. I'm working 14 hour days as it is. I, it might not sound like much to you, 30 minutes. No, I, I, I just can't do it. And finally my doctor said to him, then you need to prepare to die. And he wasn't joking. He just said, you're getting through this season, but ultimately it's shortening your life. 
It's not just a season. It has become your lifestyle. Your life is out of balance and you're using unhealthy ways to cope with an out of balanced life. You're living a just get through this day life, but in the end, that just get through the day life is going to shorten your life. What he's had found is that he was medicating the pain of an out of control life instead of addressing the cause of pain. That's a short-term solution that leads to long-term problems. If we have so much stress that we need nicotine and too much alcohol and too much sugar and not enough sleep and no exercise to get through it, we might say, instead of just trying to get through it, maybe I need to change my life, I need to change my vows, I need to make some decisions. Doctors numb us to fix the problems, and that's healthy. When we numb ourselves to forget the problems, that's unhealthy. And that's where I think our culture majors in, numbing ourselves to the problems instead of turning to God. The abundant life is a God who cares for us holistically. He cares for our relationships. He cares for our health. He cares for our minds. He says, I want you to take care of yourself because of what I can do for you. Somebody who worked with horses told me a curious phenomenon I'd never heard of before. That when there's a barn fire, you know, they run in and they get the horses, but they said, you've got to hold on to the reins of the horse very tightly. I said, why is that? And they said, well, the horse will run back into the barn that's burning. So why, why would they do that if they're panicking? They explain that horses are real homebodies. They, they feel comfortable at home. That barn is where they feel safe. And, and so if they're off, that's why they can't wait to get back home. And if they feel stressed, they want to be where they feel comfortable. And so when they're panicking beyond their mind, the way their brains function, they're thinking, I've got to go where I feel safest, which is my barn, even if the barn is burning. And they end up killing themselves. And I found that I've had barns, places I go when I feel stressed, when I feel threatened, when I feel shame, I go to that barn. For me, that barn has always been sugar. I grew up, I, I love sugar. I, I married a woman who's such a healthy eater, which is a blessing and a burden, as you could imagine, in, in many different ways. Uh, she grew up eating 100% whole wheat bread and, well, you know, things that grow, stuff like that. And I was Captain Crunch, Big Mac's pizza. I mean, I would put sugar on my Frosted Flakes uh, in the morning when I was growing up as a kid. And so when I was just starting out years ago, uh, I had just published my first book. I was speaking at a benefit dinner. And usually you don't sell many books at a benefit dinner because they're not there to hear you. They're there to support the charity. I didn't know that. I mean, I've got a lot more experience. So I had all these hopes for this book. I just had one book to put on the table, so I put it up. And it was in a place that isn't known for its literacy. I mean, it's very different around the country how many books you sell, which is why we always love it when Keith says things like leaders are readers. I mean, authors love to hear things like that. But this is a place that isn't known for its literacy. And I, I don't want to slam a whole region, so I'll just say it was west of Virginia, uh, where I was in a small town. And I gave it, and the talk went well. People were, some of the women, they were crying. People were laughing at the right points. Everything was going well. I got done, and, so started, and I didn't sell a single book. I thought, well, how, how am I going to make it as an author and a writer? And I, I felt that fear. I felt the shame. I felt the embarrassment just standing there. And so afterwards, I go, oh, I know what will make me feel better. I drive straight to Dairy Queen, right? A blizzard, fries with salt, that's going to make me feel better. And there's nothing scandalous about it. A church isn't going to fire me because I went to Dairy Queen. I'm not going to be a headline pastor goes to Dairy Queen late at night. But I was so convicted the next morning when I was praying. And I felt the Lord challenging me, saying, Gary, you felt shame. You felt embarrassment. You felt fear. And he just fed it. And I'm so stupid, you know, I want to argue, well, at least it's not porn, right? Or a strip club. I mean, what do most young guys go to? And, and yes, don't play that game with me. We're not going to trade sins. It's not a sin to go to Dairy Queen. I still occasionally do. It's why you were going there. It's what you were using for. It's the narcotic. Instead of turning to me, instead of finding a healthy solution, you're doing something that in the end could become a real problem. This has been an issue for you throughout your life. You're that horse running into the burning barn. It makes you feel better immediately, but long term, it creates a worse situation. You've got to learn to stay out of that barn. I don't know 
what your barn is, if it's looking at something you shouldn't look at, eating something you shouldn't eat, spending something you shouldn't spend, um, earning, you know, letting hurt isolate you from relationships. But if we want to live the abundant life, we have to realize that those short-term things, narcotics, they create long-term problems. That's what God calls us out of. For me, when I ate food, it was always about whether it tasted good. That's what would determine what I ate. Then I married a very healthy woman, and I realized it's not supposed to be that. But here's a quote from Dr. Stephen Kopecki from the Mayo Clinic. Every food a person might eat either fights or contributes to disease. There's a revolutionary thought for me, what he's saying here. When you're sitting down to eat and fuel your body, is this giving you the strength you need to do the work God has called you to do, or is it contributing to a disease? And the challenge for me is most of what I like to eat would probably contribute to disease. But if eating is about nourishing our body to be fit instruments for the service of God, I had to look at it from an entirely different perspective. Finally, what I want to say is this. This is so key. Caring for your body, if we go to the next one, please, uh, after that, is actually caring for your mission. You say, why should we do this? Caring for your body is caring for your mission. This notion of being taking care of yourself, taking time to exercise, thinking about what you eat, taking time to read, taking time to sleep, not having an overbalanced life. A lot of us say, well, my family needs me, my job needs me, it's a busy time, I can cut corners here. But one of the first lessons they teach lifeguards, this is fascinating, is self-defense. Because when you're trying to save somebody in the water, in the ocean, they start to panic and they'll tear you down and you both drown. And if you both drown, Nobody gets saved. So they say, you've got to learn self-defense first because if you don't keep yourself alive, you can't keep others alive. And if you've got health habits that help you cope and you think you're more effective, but in the end they're bringing you down, the day will come when your body isn't able to help others. Our minds are feeble or we're too sick or too, too much dealing with health issues that keep us from that. Now, a lot of these health issues, it's not, body, it's not lifestyle choices. It's not what we eat. Some of us are going to get sick. We've all seen some of the healthiest eating, most exercising people get sick. Some of that is just genetic. Some of it is by God's providence. But the challenge is that if we don't care for our bodies, what we're saying is that we don't care for our mission. And it was moving to Houston that opened me up to this because... My, my time frame of what I thought a productive life be, would be was expanded considerably. When my senior pastor in Houston, Texas, this is one of those huge churches. I'm the writer of residence there on the teaching team. But the senior pastor of a church that has about 80,000 members at this point, about 25,000 people come at six different service, six different campuses throughout the weekend, is 83 years old. Now, Normally you think retirement, 62, 65, and he might be pushing it a little bit by what some people say usually is there. And I'm not saying we can't retire at that point, but what has inspired me is that he realizes he has more experience than he's ever had. He's worked with scriptures. He's probably preached four series on Romans. When he does his fifth one, he can go back and say, what would I refine? He's learned to surrender to the Holy Spirit. He has more wisdom. And because he's taking care of his body, I've seen his workout regimes, I see how careful he is about what he eats. He just thinks, God has given me this message, I still have this passion to see the church grow in Houston. There are plenty of people who are lost, he's not counting how big the church is, he's counting how many people in Houston aren't yet going to church. That he's saying, I've got to keep this body going because I realize the end is coming, but how can I push it off so that I can accomplish the mission that God has given me. And this is what I love about being a Christian, particularly when we talk about body care, because when the world looks at the body, it's all about being young and vibrant and having a certain shape. But the Bible glorifies growing old. 
Because it's not about appearance. It's about things that take time. It's about wisdom. It takes time to develop wisdom. Surrendering to the Holy Spirit. It takes experience to surrender to the Holy Spirit. Familiarity with Scripture. It takes a lifetime to understand all of Scripture. Experience working with others. All of those things is what make the elderly more valuable in God's tools than even the young. Now, the world may not value those qualities as much as they value strength and appearance and charisma. But when when you look at scripture it is clear that's what God values most so if I want to take this message home I have to reject the world's values and say what matters most to God it's a new experience for me and many of you men face this long ago when your son supersedes you as an athlete now it happened to me a long time ago but when your son out drives you in your golf when your son runs faster than you when your son is stronger than you and my son, he's in his late 20s, he's in great shape, he does triathlons, he's a good looking young man, and he came in for a vacation, it was like a Thanksgiving thing or something, so I took him to the athletic club. And for a while, I hadn't adjusted my brain, because Graham and I are walking to these things, and I see these younger women stop and turn. And I, I've been invisible to young women for about 25 years, <laughs> which is appropriate. I mean, if a young woman has interest, she needs months and months of therapy. So I, I, I don't expect it to be any other way, but I thought, is my fly open? Is I, I mean, no, I'm wearing shorts. And then I, oh, I'm with my son. Okay, I mean, it, it made sense. And then I just kind of chuckle at it. And then he, we basically did sort of a try workout. We. We went for a run. It was a speed workout for me. It was a recovery workout for him. We get in the pool. He's like a dolphin. I'm like, you know, hold on the end of everything. And then we get on the bike and he's like Lance Armstrong. I'm like, I mean, I couldn't begin to keep up with him. And in the world's eyes, I mean, I'm not worth looking at. I'm not worth celebrating. But in God's eyes, those aren't the things that are valued. It's wisdom, it's character, it's experience. It's all of the things that take time. And so I have to reject the world's values. It's God's creational design that we get older, that our bodies aren't gonna look the same, we're not gonna be as strong, we're not gonna be as fast, but that can allow us to focus on the things that God values, that in God's eyes are even more important. Because it comes down to this, we are given one body to carry the message. And if God has given you a family, and if God has given you faith, and He's led you into the faith, what if you could be there not only for your grandchildren, but your great-grandchildren? If God has given you great business wisdom, what if now that you've made it, you could spend the next 10 or 15 years mentoring other young men, other young Christian men that really need your experience, that you have the energy and the wisdom and the vitality. Say, look, I've made it and I want to help you make it. I don't need any more, but I want to help you get more. If we don't take care of our bodies, it becomes a selfish thing because if without a body, we can't mentor. We can't speak. We can't encourage. We can't be there for our grandkids or our great-grandkids. And we have opportunities in this day and age that, frankly, our ancestors just didn't. The life expectancy of a boy born in 1900 in this country was 47 years. God has given us a chance to live two and a half lifetimes for some of us. I mean, it, it, at least two lifetimes over that when you look at life expectancy now. So taking care of our body is just respecting the mission that God has given us when we're best, which is why the Apostle Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 9, I'm running hard for the finish line. I'm giving it everything I've got. No sloppy living for me. I'm staying alert and in top condition. I'm not going to get caught napping. Here's the thing. If there are about 200 people in this room, let me suggest maybe half of you will say, you know, maybe these scriptures are true. Maybe God will convict you and say, you know, I, 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 I'm not going to fool myself that everything is going to change, but I can make some small choices. And if we do that, I don't think it's a stretch to say that could give many of us another year of life. Maybe not chronologically, though some studies would say more than that, but years of vitality and energy when we can focus and think and be fully engaged. 
And when I read the Gospels, and I just read this recently in the Gospels, Jesus is pleading with his disciples, pray for more workers. Why does he say that? Because this message is the most important. The world is obsessed with political issues and what's happening with climate and what's happening in popular culture and even sports teams. And some of that, again, is okay. But Jesus is saying this, this is the most important work. It's the most important message, the message of God's love and grace and salvation and, and bringing God and people back together and people back together with people because of Jesus. He says we need more Workers, there's not enough of us. So those of us who are workers, if a hundred of you will add one year to your life, we've given God a hundred years of Christian service when guys who are firing at their very best, most experienced, most surrendered, most helpful, one of the best gifts we can give God. This isn't about selfishness. It's not about being an ornament. It's about being an instrument in God's hand. Let's pray. Father, your word, though it does challenge us, though it does confront our appetites and our pleasures and our self-indulgences, it's always for our benefit. It's always for our good. We are blessed most when we live an obedient life. Lord, you know the bodies you've given us. You know the spiritual challenges each man faces now. For some, it might be getting their first physical in a long time. For others, it might be cutting down on a little bit of this or adding a little bit of that. But I just pray that where I've spoken your truth, your spirit would come now and bring conviction, encourage, and empowerment. That there would be a new service and energy and vitality here in Eau Claire and throughout the state as we seek to be your instruments of righteousness through whom you can reach this world, our families, businesses, and friends. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I um, spoke this morning out of uh, Everybody Matters, if you want more of that. And I just wanted to mention the card that was on your table. I'm sorry we threw cards on there when you said there wouldn't be cards. Oh, cluttered it up. This just came out on Tuesday, When to Walk Away, Finding Freedom from Toxic People. It's not particularly a marriage book, it's relationship. There are stories of men in business who have toxic bosses, toxic co-workers. There is been on families, how you deal with in-laws, how you deal with toxic adult children. The notion is our ministry is so important, we need to be willing to walk away from the toxic people that are not going to be changed, that don't appreciate our message, so that we can find the reliable people that we can invest in that we can use. My eyes were open when a friend pointed out to me how many times Jesus walked away from people or let people walk away from him. I always thought of that as a failure. If there wasn't change, if there wasn't commitment, I, I, I must have done something wrong. I wasn't acting out of love. I couldn't believe that Jesus failed. And I realized I was just blinded to a lot of Jesus' practices and a lot of Jesus' and the apostles' words in Scripture. This might help some of your wives get free. If they're letting out of misplaced guilt, toxic people have too big of a role in their life. And so um, what Zondervan did, thank you, you got that up. If th this card expires October 26th, but if you go to windowwalkwaybook.com and buy the book online, they'll give you another one to give away within 10 days. You just have to give them the documentation. We do have some hard copies here um, if you want to get it right now, but you can get it online. You have to do it through Amazon online to get to buy one get one free offer. Thank you all, and I'll be over the table there with, with Fred. Uh, I want to make a personal confession about the history of why this happened today, and, and hope and pray and trust and urge that, that uh, Gary's words made an impact. I served as an elder of a church for about 30 years and a meeting, I'm going to say 15 years ago, 12 years ago, I don't remember exactly when, there were about nine of us in the room. And as elders we went around the room and, and we always had uh, time to care for each other before we prayed and cared for the people of our church, right? And as we're caring for each other, uh, and I'm not exaggerating here, about eight of the nine men that I sat at that table with we're taking cholesterol medication or blood pressure medication or had serious heart 
problems at the time and were struggling physically uh, with their health. Men that were champions of mine, heroes of mine, godly men who had committed their lives to shepherding and serving others and sharing the gospel and shepherding people. But their health, their health was fading fast. And these weren't old men. And a dear friend of many of ours, Stan Williams, is somebody that, that went home to be with the Lord way early in life in his mid-50s. And there are times where I have wondered to myself if I shouldn't have or couldn't have fought harder to encourage him uh, about his health issues. And this message is deep-rooted me, with me personally to you men, because I just love the way Gary finished about the need for workers in the field. You know, why we exist is to identify uh, men who have been turned off by church and aren't going to come to church, but they might come here, and we know that we're going to have a man that's going to give them information that will benefit them, but also we'll have a Jesus story to tell to reconnect them with their God. And if you're here, today in that condition, you're why we exist. And we will require nothing of you other than to come back again, and to come back again, and to bring friends to come back again, uh, because we're not going to be heavy handed, we're not going to preach to you, but most of you already kind of understand the fundamentals of Christian faith. And we want to come beside you to encourage you to multiply you to ask you to multiply the workers in the field for the greatest message, as Gary said, that we can give. And I told Gary before he spoke, I said, the reason I had you come in here to give that message was because you get to leave. <laughs> and if I would browbeat you to the same effect <laughs> about these issues, then I got to stay and live with you. <laughs> But really, from the bottom of my heart, I admire you as men. But it breaks my heart when I see men surrendering their physical health for whatever reason. Stress, I'm so busy. There's guys that are not here today that plan to be here, but they feel like the business world can't live without them. And I want to tell you, it's not true. <laughs> it's not true. Stop, take a breath. Take care of yourself. Uh, some of the changes maybe need to be radical. I doubt that that's true, that adjustments, small adjustments over a period of time. Um, another reason we exist and, and why I want to recommend after hours to you is because a lot of this is almost impossible to do by yourself, but if you get an accountability partner. Tim Tozer is one of the most fit men I know. He's lost a lot of weight recently. He works hard on his fitness and training and and shepherds his business and shepherds his family but I also know he has a training partner and he has uh, accountability people that have helped him in this process and there's all kinds of men in this room uh, that, and, and I, I'd be happy to be one of those guys for you. Um, Larry Winter sits here as a healthy man and I admire him so much and he's a dear friend and but we've done a lot of this together and there's been a team that has contributed to, to uh, so he's still here because he knows the Lord and he knows the gospel and he knows how to serve people. And, and that's what we want to prolong. Last thing I'm going to say to you before you get your billfolds out and buy lots of books is some of you are not planning to go to the couples event tonight and you know that you need to go. And there will still be a chance to go because this book, Cherish, uh, if you think you have no problems in your marriage, you will love this book. If you've been at, I've been married 42 years, I read this book about three months ago or so, or maybe a little longer, and it opened up a whole nother window of how to cherish each other, how to serve each other, what our role before God is, is to turn the facets of our wives forward so that they shine and that they're the star of our of our households 
And when two people do that together for each other, you will be doing yourself a huge favor by coming tonight and bringing your wife tonight. And I, like I said, there are five more tickets available that Fred has over there. So you don't have to go home, but you can only stay here if you're buying tickets or books. 